In the aftermath of the Great War, it's difficult to separate fact from fiction, history from myth, truth from legend. What is never in doubt is that in the autumn of 2281, a courier accepted a parcel that would change the course of their lives and the entire Mojave forever. This account is just one of the many that follow the courier through their journey. This is Legends of the Mojave. The courier had been walking for what seemed like hours. Every gust of wind and skittering of dust particles had him on edge. He was alone, vulnerable, but armed and dangerous. Every second he was alone was spent thinking, strategizing, fantasizing about catching the dandy in the plaid smoking jacket. How would he do it? Take his revenge? What if it happened just up at the next bend in the road? What if they were hunkered down behind that billboard just ahead? He was so engrossed in his thoughts that he hardly noticed that the road had suddenly changed direction and opened to four lanes. A nearby sign somehow continued to carry a 200-year-old message to travelers, Interstate 15, known to most these days as the Long 15. Just across the road sat a small shack overlooking the barely discernible remains of a pre-war private airstrip. After ducking inside to see if there was any decent loot, he stepped outside and looked down onto the runway. Patrolling the area were men wearing the same uniform as Joe Cobb, the man who had threatened Trudy back in Good Springs. They were armed, but they didn't seem to pay him much mind. Apparently, a lone traveler with a rifle on his back and a pistol at his side was too much risk to justify the reward. The courier didn't want to overstay his welcome, so he returned to the roadway and made a snap decision. He had been warned against traveling north on the Long 15, nobody could give him a concrete reason why, and as he looked up and down the roadway he could see more of these uniformed men patrolling checkpoints all along the road in either direction. These men must be the danger he was warned against. Since it didn't seem to make much of a difference whether he traveled north or south, he decided to head north. He needed to keep pace with his quarry, and if they had disregarded the danger as he had, then he would have to take the same route if he wanted to catch up. If they headed south to avoid it, there was a possibility he could catch them before they made it to Vegas, maybe even get there first. As he traveled north, he found the putrid remains of caravans strewn across the scorching blacktop. Apparently, traders with their slow-moving, heavily laden pack brahmin were deemed to be worth the risk to these men. Their presence set the courier on edge and probably saved his life. Geckos, coyotes, and other scavengers that could have gotten the upper hand if they had taken him by surprise were instead spotted ahead of time and picked off easily by the courier thanks to his heightened diligence. As he approached a rocky pass, the courier clutched his weapon tight. There was a roadblock ahead. As he approached, a grizzled man who looked like he had spent his life swinging a sledgehammer tried to warn him off. The area wasn't safe. This small encampment, known as Sloan, consisted of a few rundown shacks and served as barracks, bar, and main office for this operation. The watchman was named Chomps Lewis, and he was the foreman for this crew. Just up the Long 15 was an old stone quarry. Lewis's crew were contracted to mine limestone for the New California Republic to be sent to Boulder City to be turned into concrete for fortifications to Hoover Dam. They were contracted, but not doing much quarrying these days. A gang of NCR prisoners who were being put to work building new roadways for the NCR had staged a jailbreak at a prison to the south. They called it a jailbreak, but the reality was far worse. They had managed to kill or run off all of the prison guards and took complete control of a fortified defensible complex. Soon after their daring rebellion, the Powder Gangers, as they now called themselves, rolled into Sloan, took the explosives that they normally used for quarrying, and returned to the prison flush with new implements of destruction. Without any dynamite, the quarry closed, and the crew and Sloan had nothing to do but sit around and get drunk at the camp canteen while they waited for the NCR to send fresh supplies. But something far more dangerous than Powder Gangers had moved into the quarry. Seems a pack of Deathclaws decided the quarry would make for good nesting grounds and in the absence of humans and high explosives were flourishing. The road north was infested with them now. Only a fool would try to sneak through Deathclaw territory. The courier took inventory of the measly arsenal at his possession. The varmint rifle given to him by Sunny Smiles, a 9mm handgun taken from Barton Thorne, and a barely functional 9mm submachine gun he had fixed up from Doc Mitchell's office. It wouldn't be enough to fight even a lone Deathclaw, no less a pack, no less the monstrous hulks that would be leading the pack. The courier was beside himself. 
he had just wasted the better part of a day traveling a dead-end roadway. His gamble on being able to catch up with his attackers had been met with an 18-carat run of bad luck. He had lost valuable time, and any chance of being able to catch up or cut off his target was now lost. Just then a tamed mole rat limped over to the courier, wheezing that raspy little breath that they do, looking for a scratch behind the ears. The courier, intrigued by the animal's limp, checked out the varmint's leg and found that it was wounded. He set to work cleaning the wound and was nearly finished bandaging before it occurred to him what he was doing. Was this a skill that he had practiced so much in Good Springs that it had become second nature? Or had he been like this before he was shot? He couldn't tell for certain. All he knew was that as he finished bandaging up Snuffles and rubbed its wrinkled head, that it felt good to be of help to someone, even if that someone had a bit of an odor and looked like a hillbilly ghoul. He filled Chomps Lewis in on what he had just done, and Lewis made sure to thank the courier for saving the camp mascot. It wasn't much, but the courier now saw that there was more to his mission than just getting revenge, forcing justice. Call it karma, call it the golden rule, call it whatever you like. The courier wasn't about to abandon his mission, but it was now obvious that if he ever did find his target, the meeting would have to take place on their terms, not his. So from here out, the courier would lend a hand where he could, make friends, gain resources, collect information, and most importantly, make sure that he didn't take any unnecessary risks. He wasn't going to be blinded by hatred and impatience again, so he slung his varmint rifle across his shoulder, finished his dealings with the good people of Sloan, and headed south. I hope you're enjoying our journey so far, but just as a friendly reminder, a like on the video lets us know the sort of content that provides meaningful value to you. Just in case you're interested in stuff besides Fallout, like science fiction for example, we have a sister channel where we discuss all things sci-fi. Check it out when you're done here if you're interested, please, thank you, and now on with our tale. When he reached the Powder Ganger outpost, the courier stopped and gazed down the long drive toward the old prison. He couldn't understand why, but something compelled him to detour to see what the Powder Gangers were up to in their fenced-in complex. He was hassled at the door by a man named Dawes, but the doorman was also strangely talkative and forthright with information about the group. I guess OPSEC wasn't high on their list of priorities. The New California Republic Correctional Facility, or NCRCF if you ain't got much time, was a prison complex operated by the NCR. They used the prisoners as free labor for building new roads, but the working conditions were horrendous. Finally, a small group of prisoners pocketed some explosives from their worksite and staged a successful breakout. Most everyone in here was here for different reasons. Some were cold-blooded killers, some were arrested for relatively minor infractions. One was even a lawman in a previous life, arrested because he helped speed justice along one too many times. As it turns out, the prisoners fractured and broke off into several smaller groups after the breakout. One group led by the mastermind behind the rebellion set off towards the north to start a guerrilla war against the NCR. Another set off to the south without much of a goal in mind when they left. Those that remained at the prison largely organized into a group run by a fellow named Eddie who weren't really in it for the end of the NCR, but knew that the role they played in the breakout meant that they would either get a firing squad or life in a prison even worse than this one if they were ever recaptured. They set up the outposts on the Long 15 and manned the guard towers and prison defenses in wait for the inevitable NCR counterattack. However, there were many others here at the prison who weren't even involved in the breakout. Some were close to serving their sentences or just didn't have that much time to serve to begin with, or they were living even worse lives in the wasteland than they had in prison. These prisoners remained because they didn't want to make things worse for themselves. The courier went up to the old warden's office to speak with Eddie. He wasn't much of a conversationalist, that's for sure, but it seemed like he actually cared about his men's safety. One of his outposts, run by a man named Chavez, had turned rogue and had been hitting passing caravans. So it hadn't been the Powder Gangers per se who had been gunning down traitors on the Long 15 and leaving them to rot. Perhaps the Courier had been right to withhold judgment on them. The Courier still didn't trust Eddie as far as he could piss, but if he had the chance to keep just one caravan from meeting that same sad end, he was in. As he had to leave the prison the same way he came, he passed Myers, the old sheriff on his way out, and had to wonder to himself, were they really that different? One lawman who took justice into his own hands, the courier who was hell-bent on doing the same. It felt wrong in theory, but in practice, who else was going to do it if not the courier? 
Was this not a fitting punishment? The questions he asked in the silence of his own mind were met with no answers as he closed the distance to Chavez's camp. When he finally reached the camp, the courier was struck by the sheer stupidity and aimlessness of Chavez and his crew. He walked right into the camp with no alarm raised, and Chavez, who was seemingly unarmed, even tried to stick up the courier. Waste of human potential, every last one of them. Still, something stayed his hand. Again, the courier couldn't put a finger on it, but he had every reason to bring violence down upon these men. Instead, he sought to reason with Chavez, convince him to stop preying on caravans. It was actually damn easy. They packed up and set off into the wastes never to be seen again. After returning for his reward, it turned out that Eddie had some other odd jobs for him. One was to figure out why a man had been hanging around their outposts. Turns out it was a bounty hunter trying to bait someone into coming out after him. He was easy enough to tell off. But then Eddie gave a bigger assignment. Head south to the town of Prim and figure out if the NCR was planning an assault to retake the prison. This assignment left the courier much more conflicted. From what he had been told, the NCR was an almost comically inept government. They seemed to induct territory with or without the consent of the people, whether or not they had the manpower to hold or stabilize the new territory. They paid their workers in currency with poor exchange rates and forced their citizens to pay taxes whether they were willingly inducted or not. But they seemed to at least be attempting to do what governments are supposed to do, keep the population safe and provide infrastructure. The courier was starting to think he had really stepped in it this time. He could turn around, back out of the deal. The powder ganger seemed to be living on borrowed time and many of them had chosen a life of violence and crime, if not when they broke out of prison when they wound up in that place to start with. The courier was still pondering these things as he approached Prim. The town was surprisingly well-developed and intact, with large multi-level structures that appeared to be well-preserved and mostly fenced in. It was mainly accessible from an overpass running over I-15, with one side being guarded by the NCR. I guess this was it, time to see what their people were made of. He hadn't even made it into the NCR encampment when he was stopped by a sentry who warned him to stay away. Apparently the town had been invaded by NCRCF convicts who had escaped. Anyone still alive was in hiding, while the streets in the Bison Steve Hotel, the largest building in Prim, were now occupied by the cons. The NCR outpost was woefully undermanned for attempting to retake the town, and the people here had never formally accepted NCR rule, so they technically weren't obligated to assist. Typical government bureaucracy. After getting the runaround from Lieutenant Hayes, the NCR garrison commander, the courier decided to head into Prim to get intel from the locals. He had tangled with the powder gangers many times by now and always talked his way out, so it would likely be more of the same. The convicts patrolling the streets opened fire. They had shed their NCRCF uniforms and now for all intents and purposes were no longer powder gangers. Now they were just garden variety outlaws. The courier fought his way into the Vicky and Vance casino, where it turns out the entire town of Prim was now taking shelter. There was a Protectron and a couple folks with pistols, so it wasn't completely helpless, but it was clear that the situation was in stalemate, and it was only a matter of time before the convicts across the street exhausted the Bison Steve's food stores and came in after the rest of the town. As the courier asked around the Vicky and Vance, he came across John Nash, the man who ran the Mojave Express courier service. The courier handed him the receipt Doc Mitchell rescued and Nash filled him in. Some cowboy robot had hired the Mojave Express to have six couriers to deliver six packages to six destinations simultaneously. Each item was seemingly innocuous and could be found in pretty much any junk pile on a New Vegas street corner. Chess pieces, dice, that sort of thing. Apparently the package the courier had been carrying was originally assigned to another courier, but he had inexplicably cancelled, leaving courier 6, I guess that was his official designation, to perform the delivery last minute. When questioning shifted to asking about the man in the checkered jacket traveling with a bunch of great cons, it seemed that some had indeed rolled through town, talking about a chip of all things, possibly the courier's package. Nobody knew much else, but Deputy Beagle was probably the best source of information. Problem was, Beagle had gone and got himself snatched by the convicts and taken into Bison Steve. Anyone needing to talk to him would have to get him out of that place. The courier stepped away from that meeting, head filled with questions. He was hired by some cowboy robot. It had to have been Victor. As he gazed over at Prim Slim, the town's resident Protectron wearing a cowboy hat and greeting people in the closest thing a Protectron could approximate to a southwestern accent, he wasn't so sure anymore, but he still had his suspicions. 
Six couriers, six packages, six destinations. Someone wanted to keep the true nature of these packages hidden. According to Nash, the other five couriers had delivered their packages, so why was his singled out? And how did Checkered Jacket know which courier to hit and where he'd be? Were they working with or for that other courier who turned down the job? It seemed that any time he was presented with the answer to a question, that answer left three more questions in its place. The courier entered the Bison Steve, and one by one he cleared rooms of convicts. Luckily for him, they were disorganized and were easy to pick off as he crept through the hotel. He and Beagle made their escape, but Beagle, the sniveling brat that he was, refused to answer any questions about the courier's attackers unless Prim got a new sheriff. Apparently, he wasn't too thrilled with the idea of people looking to him to deal with dangerous ruffians menacing the streets of Prim. The courier had two options. Myers, currently sitting in lockup, might be convinced to leave the NCRCF and put a badge on once again, or he could appeal to Lieutenant Hayes, the leader of the NCR squad currently trying to contain the powder gangers from their base camp here in Prim. The courier was surprised at how hard this decision was to make. It seemed Myers and the courier were two sides of the same coin, and Myers, for his part, had been honest about why he was sitting in lockup, and even after all the guards had gone from the prison, he chose to stay, willing to keep serving his sentence. He played fast and loose with procedure and with people's lives, but he did seem to have a personal code of honor. The courier looked up and down the Vicky and Vance at the remaining survivors. Despite the large buildings, Prim was an even smaller town than Good Springs. The people here couldn't afford a sheriff who shot first and asked questions later. This left him with the NCR as his only option. Now that the convicts had been dealt with, it should be easy enough to convince them to leave a few men in Prim to serve as lawbringers. The NCR, after all, seemed to be reasonable, and many of the problems in the region could just as easily be blamed on the Powder Ganger outbreak as it could on NCR indifference. Lieutenant Hayes was agreeable to the notion of securing the town and providing a peacekeeping force to stabilize the situation, but he couldn't spare any men. His mission had not changed. The NCRCF needed to be retaken, and he couldn't afford to split his forces. The courier found himself at a crossroads. This was it. The information Eddie had sent him to get. Confirmation that the NCR was planning to assault the prison. It was going to be a bloodbath. He had to do something. He rushed back to the NCRCF, hoping he could reason with Eddie, to convince him and his men to either abandon the prison or surrender. Neither would be an easy sell, but many of the people still in the prison didn't want to be part of any of this. The courier arrived, but of all the rotten luck, he arrived just as the NCR assaults began. There wasn't enough time to prevent violence. The courier desperately ran, trying to avoid getting caught in the crossfire. Powder Ganger Dynamite was met with NCR grenades. Riot Gear met with service rifles. When the dust settled, the NCR assault had failed. The prison was still occupied by Powder Gangers. Eddie and his cronies had all died in the assault, but the NCR team gunning down anyone not wearing a military uniform were finally overpowered by the few prisoners who were left. As the courier sat there basking in his failure, a thought struck him. This was probably the best case scenario. The powder gangers who were left had no direction, no leadership, nobody to fill their heads with ideas of standing up to the NCR, of rebellion. Whoever was left would be more passive, more willing to negotiate, to surrender, or simply abandon the fort and try to make it out in the wastes. Hayes' assault had failed, but now he didn't have to worry about Eddie sending raiding parties, and the courier's actions had wiped out the most dangerous and uncontrollable elements of the NCRCF prisoners. If anyone still felt like fighting, so be it. They deserved their fate. For now at least, the courier was done with the powder gangers. But Hayes was still short-handed, now more than ever. So there was really only one thing to do, keep heading south and try to convince Hayes' superiors to send reinforcements. The journey was long and arduous. Along the way, he fought off a raider ambush at the old state police station, a whole pile of scorpions at an old Poseidon station, and finally, just as the sun was beginning to settle down, he came to it, Mojave Outpost the NCR's main way station and base of operations for troops positioned south of Vegas. The courier was able to meet with Major Knight, Hayes' superior. It took some convincing, but Knight agreed to send reinforcements to Prim. The courier made a quick stop at the canteen, sold off some of the trade goods he had acquired, and replenished his ammunition, before stepping out once more to take the I-15 north. By the time he made it back to Prim, word of the NCR's efforts to reinforce the garrison had already reached the town. Hayes appointed one of his NCOs to become sheriff, and the people were once again safe. 
But life in Prim was about to change drastically. Prim was now under the direct control of the NCR military, martial law complete with curfews, edicts, and all the trimmings. The townsfolk were forced to accept NCR citizenship and to begin paying taxes to the NCR. Deputy Beagle, having all of two months of law enforcement experience, was fired and replaced with NCR troopers. This was what the NCR was. Rules and regulations. Taxes owed for services rendered. Had this really been the lesser of two evils? Some folks seemed to appreciate the town's newfound discipline, but most resented the NCR and the courier who made it all possible. The courier went to Beagle. He wasn't particularly thrilled with the way the courier had handled his request to bring Blaw back to Prim, but a deal was a deal. He owed the courier an explanation. The well-dressed man and great cons rolled through town talking about taking a package from some courier and were apparently on their way to Novak through Nipton. The courier thanked him and left the newly unemployed deputy to loaf about. He finally had a direction, but he was now delayed beyond any chance of catching up. His failed attempt to take I-15 north, running errands for the powder gangers and constant trips up and down the Long 15 from the NCRCF to the Mojave outpost had put him days behind schedule and were taking their toll physically. For now, Prim was safe and secure, and he needed rest. By now, his quarry was long gone. They had to have reached New Vegas by now. So the courier made what seemed like the easiest decision he had made in a long time. He was going to stay in Prim and rest up for a few days. He didn't know what the road through Nipton or up to Novak would have in store for him, but he was going to be prepared. He had had his first run-in with the Great Bear of the Mojave. He didn't yet know it, but he was soon to face another beast, one with a very different temperament.